Okay, if we could turn, please, to the book of Revelation and chapter 12. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 7 down to verse 17. Uh, we began looking at this chapter last week, and we're going to continue on. A very, very significant chapter, beginning in verse 7. It says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night." And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent." And the serpent cast out of his mouth water in a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ." So in today's uh, session, what we want to consider is Satan cast out. We already began to look at that uh, topic last time, and uh, we, we want to break in in verse 9, uh, where it talks about the, uh, the fact that he was cast out, the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so what we see is that Michael and the elect angels prevail in this mighty contest uh, in heaven, and uh, they prevail, and Satan and the demons, uh, the, follow, the angels that had followed with Satan in his rebellion, a third of them were cast out of heaven. And of course, uh, there's a description uh, here of uh, this serpent, of course, he's the devil and Satan, which and again, this is the part that I want us to see, which deceiveth the whole world. And I want us to notice this, that, that this is not Satan's boast. This is heaven's acknowledgement. In other words, it's not saying, I'm the one that's deceived the whole world. God is acknowledging in the text of Scripture that the world is being deceived by the serpent. And, and I wonder, do we really see that? Do we really see it? We can see it in a spiritual sense, but I wonder, do we see it in, in a much bigger sense that the whole world is being deceived even as we speak by Satan? Uh, and uh, he's very effective in his, uh, we've said before that he's the chief minister of propaganda and lies. He's a liar from the very beginning. And so this is, this is his activity at this moment in time. And so certainly he is called the deceiver. Now, let's just look at another couple of scriptures that talk about this deceptive work of the evil one. Second Timothy chapter three and verse 13, it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving, and then notice this, and being deceived. And so we can see that as our culture, we can see 
uh, the, this very thing happening, evil men and seducers are getting worse and worse. So we see the decline in civilization, but they're deceiving. But then we need to also recognize that they as themselves are being deceived. Uh, second epistle of John and verse seven, just to, to get this idea of this incredible deception that is going on in our world. And the only thing that can keep us from succumbing to the seductive deception, uh, doctrines of demons and all the things that are going on is by being anchored in the word of God. Uh, second epistle of John verse seven, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And so, of course, one of the biggest deceptions is to uh, get people to to not believe that Christ came into the world and the consequences of the incarnation and the consequences of the ministry of Christ. And so we see this great deception. And so he's cast out to the earth. Now we want to see what is the reaction to Satan being cast out. And we're going to see a twofold reaction. On the one hand, we're going to see in verse 10 through 12, uh, the first part, uh, there's rejoicing in heaven. And on the second part, there's woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And so, verse 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. And again, this we've said that this event that we're looking at takes place at the midpoint of the tribulation period. There's three and a half years left. And so the idea is this, that the minute this happens, it, again, the, the clock is set in motion and time is very short, just three and a half years before this deceiver is going to be put to an end, in a sense. He's going to be cast into the abyss. And so uh, there's rejoicing in heaven because at the same time, that means that the kingdom of the Lord Jesus is also going to come. And so now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, because uh, this is all setting in motion, those last three and a half year events that will culminate in the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the announcement of the coming demonstration of salvation, strength, and Messiah's kingdom is being made. And then verse 11, uh, it says, I'm oh, sorry, again, verse 10, it says, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And so what a wonderful thing that uh, his access uh, to heaven to accuse the brethren has now come to an end. He's done it day and night. Uh, it's been his occupation. You, we saw it in the book of Job where he he wants to, uh, you know, kind of even question why anybody would believe in God. They're only doing it because of what they can get out of it, all the rest of it. He's constantly accusing the brethren. And again, we don't want to join him in that. We want to speak well of God's people. But that's what he's doing. He's the accuser of the brethren. But uh, one thing that we need to remind ourselves about this accuser, because uh, we, we sometimes hear the accuser roar, but we need to remind ourselves of the marvelous words in the epistles to the, to the Romans, Romans 8, verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And so isn't it wonderful to know that even though he accuses, God has justified us. If we're truly children of God, we've been declared righteous by God on the basis of the fact that Christ died for us. And all of his accusations, they may even be true. We, we all know that we have failed miserably in many, many ways. And so, but it doesn't matter. God knew that. And when Christ died for us and God declared us righteous, justified us by faith, nothing, no charge that's made will ever stick. 
who shall lay any charge against God's elect? It's God that justifies. God is satisfied with the work of his son on our behalf, and it just doesn't stick. And so praise God for that. But nevertheless, the accuser, uh, his accusative ministry has come to an end. He's cast out, no longer access to heaven, no longer being able to speak ill of the saints in the presence of God. And so then it says in verse 11, how did the saints respond anyway? How do we respond to the accuser? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And isn't that good to know that when the accuser roars, we just need to remind him, yes, it is true. I am a rotten sinner, but Jesus shed his precious blood for me. And that satisfies God. <laughs> and so isn't it wonderful that uh, overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Yes, I know I'm not perfect, but boy, I'm not what I used to be. God has done a work in my life. I'm saved by grace through faith, and I know whom I believed. And, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which he's committed to me until that day. And so the word of their testimony. And then, interestingly enough, particularly at this time in history, it says they love not their lives unto death. And we said that part of this passage not only is talking about the accuser, but it's talking about his failures, that he's he's a failure, that even his accusations, they're met with God's uh, answer. God's answer is, you can't lay any charge against my elect because I've justified them. I've declared them righteous. But here, even further, there's, a, there's an evidence of the failure of Satan because one of his, his false ideas, if you go back to the book of Job just for a second, I want us to look at Job chapter 2. And we're going to see that he has proved to be wrong. Uh, he's a failure even in his thinking. And so Satan, verse 4 of, of Job chapter 2, it says, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And so what he's saying is, uh, you know, his Job is following you, but if you touch his life, uh, he's going to deny you. He's going to he's going to abandon faith. And 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 he, in his thinking, people will do anything to save their skin, and they will not uh, kind of hold on to their testimony in the face of death. Well, praise God! Thousands and hundreds of thousands of martyrs throughout history have proved Satan to be a liar, and here they prove it too. It says they love not their lives unto death in other words uh we're going to be seeing after satan is cast down a lot of martyrs are going to die in that second three and a half years but they 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 do not love their lives unto death they 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 will not deny the savior or his claims they will overcome come by the blood of the lamb they know the significance of the blood of christ they know the significance of what Christ has done for them, the reality of their testimony. And no matter how severe the opposition and the persecution, they will not deny the Lord Jesus. And so, again, proving Satan's failure, his wrong thinking, uh, his error, even in assessing humanity, because there have been and will be hundreds of thousands of people who will rather die than deny the Lord Jesus. And of course, we've often talked about this. Uh, Lord, I don't know how I do. I'm a chicken. You know, we tend to think that way. But God never gives us martyr's grace until we need it. But he, his grace is always sufficient, and he would provide that grace for us when we needed it. And it's good to know that isn't it but nevertheless these people they love not their lives unto the death and so verse 12 says therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them and then great rejoicing in heaven satan's cast out that, that awful uh, malicious accuser and now it says woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea these are what we call the the earth dwellers it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you 
having great wrath because he knoweth that his time is short. Satan is, we might say, hopping mad. He is very angry because he's being cast out of heaven, because he no longer has access to the presence of God, and, and also because he recognizes his time is short. The one thing about the devil is he's not ignorant of the scriptures. He he's very aware of the book of Revelation <laughs> and he knows that he's only got three and a half years. He knows his time is short. He knows the exact details of it. Uh, Revelation chapter 20. And this is what's amazing that the man is so blinded or the person mind, the spirit being is so blinded by his hatred of God and by his pride that even though the scripture predicts his doom, he still persists in his mad career. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So, so he is very aware of all this. He's not ignorant of scripture. And because he realizes he only has a short time, his wrath is very evident. Uh, he's going to do as much malicious damage to God and God's testimony and God's people as he can in that three and a half years. And also, uh, because he's such a cruel taskmaster, even his own followers, the earth dwellers, the inhabitants of the earth, are going to suffer at his hands. And you see that, don't you? That those that give their lives over to Satan, you see it in scripture, those that sell their souls, they do not live happily ever after. He is a very cruel, malicious taskmaster. And so the inhabitants of the earth, the ones that are going to be loyal to him, the ones that are going to even worship him, are going to suffer tremendously for what they do. And so it says in verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And so there is going to be a time of fierce anti-Semiticism. Satan is going to persecute Israel. Now, there's always been anti-Semiticism, um, but uh, it, it's going to be incredibly intense in that last three and a half years. And part of the reason is, uh, as we go into chapter 13, we're going to see there's going to be an image made of the beast, the man of sin, that is going to be put in the temple of God. And although in the first half, the Jewish people will be very enamored by this world ruler, when they're called to bow down and worship the beast and his image, one thing the Jews are not at this point in history, after being 70 years in Babylon, one thing they were cured of was idolatry. And they're not going to bow. And so because they're going to refuse to bow, they will be persecuted. And there will be a tremendous persecution upon the Jewish nation. And so he initially comes to power by making a covenant with them in the middle of the week. When he sets up the abomination of desolation, he breaks the covenant. And then he sets about an intense persecution upon the woman which brought forth the man-child. And we've seen that, that that is the nation of Israel. So Satan persecutes Israel. His attention is focused on that tiny nation, uh, particularly uh, the believing remnant will be uh, the object of great hostility, but all of the nation it will be uh, involved in this time of great, great persecution. And it says the woman and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. So a couple of things we need to think about here. We need to think, well, what is this 
time times and half time and then we also want to think about what does it mean that this woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness unto her place where she's nourished for that time frame so the first thing is she's carried into the wilderness on eagle's wings two wings of a great eagle now again remember we said this is a chapter where there's a lot of symbolism in it uh, does it literally mean some people have suggested that there uh, you know kind of there's going to be uh, lots of aircraft provided to to fly the jews out and rescue them there'll be kind of like a a, a massive rescue mission but again we want to look in scripture to see is there anywhere else where it talks about israel being carried on eagles wings and what does that mean so we go back to the book of exodus and chapter 19 for a moment exodus chapter 19 and verse 4 exodus 19 and verse 4 where we read this you have seen what i did unto the egyptians and how i bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself now again when when we think of they're being delivered from egypt and brought to the lord did he carry them on eagle's wings or is it pictorial language and the idea is this that that he brought them out through in a miraculous way uh delivered them through the red sea uh, but there was no flying on eagle's wings in a literal sense uh, he's just saying that he he provided a great deliverance for them look at deuteronomy 32 deuteronomy 32 again kind of before they're going back into the land that new generation going into the land of promise after the first generation had been wiped out and moses is giving them reminders of god's faithfulness to them in the past and warnings about the future and we'll break in in verse 9 it said for the lord's portion is his people jacob the lot of his inheritance he found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness he led him about he instructed him he kept him as the apple of his eye as an eagle stirreth up her nest flut uh, fluttereth over her young spreadeth abroad her wings taketh them beareth them on her wings so the lord alone did lead him and there was no strange god with him he made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. He made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, so on and so forth. But again, don't we get that same language here? He spread abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth, beareth them on her wings. And so it's the same idea that God supernaturally delivered the nation of israel from the hostility of pharaoh and his armies and was able to preserve them and protect them and bring them into the land of promise now in the book of revelation we have the very same language and what it's telling us is this that despite satan's attempt to persecute them god will supernaturally protect them and he will supernaturally bring them into a place of special care for them for three and a half years. And again, we get that three and a half years from this uh, phrase where it says she is nourished for a time and times and a half time. And so time is a year, times is two years, and a half time is six months. And that gives us a total of three and a half years oh, that 1260 days that we saw earlier in the chapter in verse six where it says the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of god that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days so basically god has got a place prepared for them and remember we said yesterday or last week that we thought that the possibility has been suggested by many that it could be Petra, uh, where the nation will be protected uh, for that time frame of three and a half years. 
Now, I want you just to go back to Isaiah just for a second and what we call Isaiah's little apocalypse. There's a, there's a section in Isaiah where a lot of the truths that we're looking at in the book of Revelation are foreshadowed and given prophetically in advance. And so many have suggested that this is a kind of looking at that time uh, when God will protect them. Uh, from this persecution. So uh, Isaiah 26, verse 20, and we'll read to verse 27, verse 1. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as if it were for a little moment until the indignations be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, the earth shall also disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. In that day, the Lord, with his saw and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, Le Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So again, God's going to defeat the enemy, uh, Levi Leviathan, that crooked serpent. But again, the picture is this. God tells them, enter into your chambers, shut your doors about you, hide yourself for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. And so there's that time frame where they're, they're protected, they're, they're cared for for three and a half years. God supernaturally bears his people, protects them uh, from the persecution that Satan is going to send upon them. So verse 15 says, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So again, still talking about this satanic persecution. And so there's this description. And again, it's another description of failure. Satan casts water out of her mouth. Uh, uh, let me just read it again. Uh, it says, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. So again, we need to try and identify what is going on here. Again, is, is this more symbolic language that we can get help from in other places? Or is this literally he's going to flood the land with water? And again, I want to suggest to you that this language, again, is used in the past of invasion. It's used of military conquest. It's used of, uh, of warfare. And so we want to just look at examples of it uh, in Scripture. And so let's, um, let's look at Psalm 124. And we just got a few references we want to uh, look at uh, as we consider this language and try to understand it again, understanding scripture from scripture, uh, trying to put things together. And so Psalm 124, it said, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us. Then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken. We are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So again, using waters overwhelming us, streams gone over us, proud waters had gone over us. But what is he talking about? He's talking about people who are persecuting them. Uh, that is the, the language. Uh, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, not speaking of a literal flood, but of this this opposition, like a rising flood that is seeking to overwhelm them. Look at Isaiah chapter 28. Again, as we're just comparing scripture with scripture and seeing how this language is used elsewhere, Isaiah 28 and verse 2 it says, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, 
which is as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. And again, it's speaking of a judgment that God is going to bring. And again, it's described in language of a mighty flood. Uh, if you look, uh, and of course, contextually here, Isaiah 28 is the Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom that is being described. Uh, that's the context of the chapter. And it says, the Lord hath a mighty strong one, which is, has a tempest of hail and is destroying storm. So again, it's used in that kind of way. Jeremiah 46 and verses 7 and 8. Jeremiah 46 verses 7 and 8. It says, who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up, and I will cover the earth, and I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. So again, uh, the uh, Egyptians who are about to invade are described as a mighty flood that is arising. Uh, chapter 47 of Jeremiah, and again, this is the uh, Egyptians coming against the Philistines um, and the, the area of Philistia. So just verse one, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines before the Pharaoh's before that Pharaoh smote Gaza. Thus saith the Lord, behold, waters rise up out of the north and shall be an overflowing flood and shall overflow the land and all that is therein, the city and them that dwell therein. Then the men shall cry and the inhabitants of the land shall howl. And so a lot of evidence, right, that this is speaking of kind of a military invasion or, or and again, one more one more piece of evidence to bring to the table. This, this is from a very prophetic portion of scripture, and that's Daniel 9 and verse 26. Daniel 9, verse 26, it says, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not of himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So again, this is speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, after crucifying the Messiah, God destroys Jerusalem. And how does he describe it? What's the language? It says, they shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. Well, as far as I have checked Roman history, uh, when they invaded Jerusalem, they didn't flood Jerusalem. It'd be very hard to flood Jerusalem because on top of a mountain and there's no river there anyway, but it was like an overwhelming military invasion that was in view. And so back in our passage and chapter 12 it says, uh, uh, verse uh, 15, uh, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. And so the idea is this, that he using his mouth, and again, we're going to see in chapter 13, he's going to actually use his puppets, uh, the false prophet and the beast is what he's going to use. And he's going to, he's going to, he's going to be there kind of speaking through them. And he's going to be whipping up hostility towards the Jews. And there's going to be an overwhelming flood of persecution that will be against them. And it says, so cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. But then it says, and again, here's his failure, verse 16, and the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now, just before we look at what that means, what we do want to say is this. Satan's flood fails. When God flooded the world, he didn't fail. It was complete, right? So again, all we just want to contrast. Satan's a failure in everything he attempts to do. And we want to see that. And, and it looks like 
Uh, he's going to carry the day. And even in our world, it looks like he's deceiving the nations. He's going to carry the day. But I want to assure everybody who's listening to this message that he is the biggest loser. And Christ is the greatest victor. And that's the message of the book of Revelation. Christ is the victor. And we want to keep that before our minds all the way through, even as we look at some of these bleak passages. And so somehow God is going to protect the nation despite this hostility. And uh, if we look back at Matthew 24, we're just going to see a little bit of uh, the Lord uh, predicting these events and uh, talking about the persecution that is going to come uh, upon the nation of Israel. And we'll break in in Matthew 24, verse 15, because this is going to be where it's all going to kind of uh, begin. It says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Okay, so so the the flashpoint is going to be the setting up of the image of the beast, which we call the abomination of desolation in the holy place in Jerusalem. When you see that, that is the signal. It's time to get out. So look at verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. There was don't even have time to pack your bag. Just get out. When you see that, you you leave. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. In other words, just go in your working gear. Go how you're ready. Just just get out. Neither uh, have, and and woe to them that are with child and them that give suck in those days, because it's going to be very difficult, traumatic. Uh, you know, ca carrying a baby, uh, all that kind of thing. But pray ye your flight be not in the winter neither on the sabbath day again that's why we're saying it's jews this is why you know the sabbath day wouldn't make any difference to us uh, i'm going to be uh, traveling home tomorrow on the sabbath day it's saturday it doesn't bother me a bit because i'm going to be on the lord's day in my home assembly uh, the sabbath day doesn't bother us but it bothers israel let it not be on the sabbath day uh, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time and and nor ever shall be and except those days should be shortened there should be no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened and so again we could go on reading in that portion but we'll stop right there but i want you to get the message that this persecution uh, it begins with the, this setting up of this image and the message is flee. And God is going to help them. God is going to protect them. God is going to help them to flee. And he's going to take them to a place that is prepared for them. And the earth, it says, will help them. And we need some help to try to understand what exactly does that mean? The earth shall help them. Let's go back to Exodus 15. Exodus chapter 15. This is the victory song when Pharaoh and his armies were destroyed. And it's um, Exodus 15. Let me see. Yeah, verse 12. Exodus 15 in verse 12. So as they're singing this song of victory, because God had delivered them, uh, from Pharaoh and his armies. Uh, this is the description. So uh, let's break in in verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. <laughs> the earth swallowed them. The very language we've got here, uh, it says the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And so what it would seem to be is that there's some providential happening of a supernatural nature that will frustrate Satan's plans to destroy Israel. 
just like you know it, i mean they pursued after on, in their chariots into the red sea uh, overwhelming force and and the lord used the language the earth swallowed them up they 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 didn't succeed uh, because god supernaturally intervened and god is going to do the very same thing now some think that part of that will be that the the gentile nations many of them that have not bought in to this uh, globalism and this whole kind of agenda of the man of sin will will provide help for the nation of israel what we call the righteous gentiles and some see and uh, maybe there's there's a lot of truth in this matthew 25 remember that portion you know when did you visit me when did you um, feed me and clothe me when i was hungry and and uh, when i was naked and he says when you did it to my brethren and matthew 25 verse 40 it says the king shall answer and say unto them verily i say unto you and as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren you have done it unto me and this judgment is called the judgment of the living nations and so it would seem that that perhaps there was gentile help for the jews at this time that would help to protect them and to offer refuge to the fleeing jews uh, maybe some of the surrounding nations uh, we can't be dogmatic but certainly uh, there's evidence to suggest god ultimately is going to protect them and preserve them there is a place prepared for them but there will be cooperation and help perhaps from righteous gentile nations that have not bought into this lie of the beast and his system so verse 17 it says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of god and that have the testimony of jesus and so particularly during this time the tribulation saints are going to be persecuted now remember we said that how how do we divide up the book of revelation and one of the things we said is that in revelation 6 there's there's a group of martyrs and they're saying how long O lord faithful and true before you judge them that have done this to us and the lord tells them wait until your fellow brethren join you in other words there's two very clear uh periods of persecution there's this first half in the first six seals persecution and then there's going to be another subsequent persecution now at that time we said those that are persecuted in the first half most likely the persecution will come from the whore uh, from the religious babylonian system there's going to be a one world religious system and those that are saved in the tribulation period that do not buy into the ecumenical agenda of the one world religious system will be persecuted and will die and those will be those that die in the first half in the second half there's another group that die but these are going to be a group that die because they refuse to bow to the beast and his image they refuse to take the mark uh, they're loyal to the lord jesus they're true followers of christ uh, in that very difficult time ones that have been saved perhaps through the ministry of the 144,000 and the two witnesses and so it says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which kept the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus christ and again, isn't it wonderful that even in the darkest period in human history, God will not leave himself without a witness. <laughs> there still will be those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so they're going to be believers in that period. And so just some practical lessons before we go into the next chapter uh, first of all this satan certainly is the accuser of the brethren please let us not join him in his activity let us not slander god's people let's try to speak as well as we can of god's people because he doesn't need our help <laughs> secondly um, 
we see that anti-Semiticism is also of satanic origin. And we've said this many times, but it's worth repeating. Part of the reason he hates Israel is their very existence is evidence of the reality of God. Israel, the word Elohim, is embedded in their name. And so that's why he hates that nation. And their very existence is proof that the Bible is true and that God is real. And so he hates them with a fierce passion. And again, we should love like Paul. And we've been talking here this week in Romans 9 and 10. And one of the things we've been bringing out is his great passion for Israel. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. If it was possible that I'd be accursed from Christ, that my brethren might be saved. Paul was even willing to do that. Now we know it wasn't possible because nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, but he was such a burden. And do we have a burden for the Jewish people? Do we pray for them? Do we live lives that cause them to provoke them to jealousy? And so uh, we need to recognize anti-Semitism is satanic origin. Satan is a deceiver of the whole earth. And we need to be aware of deception. And the only thing that will keep us from being deceived is staying in the word of God. Uh, the deception is so strong, and I believe it's getting stronger by the day. And so we need to be anchored in the word of God. And then fourthly, rejoice that ultimately Satan is the biggest loser. And the Lord Jesus, the man-child, will one day soon rule all nations with a rod of iron <laughs> so that's a wonderful kind of way to summarize what is a quite an amazing chapter but now we move into chapter 13 and chapter 13 cannot be divorced from chapter 12 you see how will satan make war with the remnant of her seed how will he persecute israel satan is going to implement his malice through the two beasts that are described in chapter 13. There's a definite link between the two chapters. This chapter reveals to us that two of the principal characters of the last days, they're puppets of Satan, and they form part of a satanic trinity, and they seek to achieve worship. Now, I want to just spend a few minutes thinking about this satanic trinity and by the way we've said all along satan doesn't have any fresh ideas he's a counterfeiter he's always wanting to imitate or counterfeit god which again is in a sense the highest form of compliment you could ever give uh, because you wouldn't want to imitate something that's not worth imitating right so so he is and again it's proof of the reality People forge $100 bills because there's value in a $100 bill. No, it's getting less and less, but there's still value in it. And so that's why they forge it. And so Satan is going to see, seek to counterfeit the real thing because the real thing is incredibly valuable. And so as we look at this counterfeit uh, satanic trinity, first of all, we've we've been introduced to the dragon, in chapter 12 and verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And what we're going to see is he imitates the father. Okay, he kind of takes the place of God the Father. The reason we could say that is when we get to this chapter 13, both beasts are subject to him. He seeks to be worshipped like the father is to be worshipped in spirit and truth. But here it's in, in deception and lies. So remember that Satan is the god of this world, small g. We get that in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. He's the god of this world. But thank God, uh, he, he's this word god of this world is the god of this age. But thank, thank God he's not the god of the age to come. <laughs> he's just the god of this age. And he he's only has temporary power. In fact, his plans will culminate in this final three and a half years where he's going to set up his empire and his kingdom. But it's short lived, three, just, just three and a half years. No wonder, in a sense, Satan calls this present time 
uh, the present evil age. <laughs> and it really is a present evil age because there's the satanic deception going on, but it's temporary. It's not going to last forever. But Satan is the god of this world. So the, so he, the dragon is Satan. And then Antichrist or the man of sin is the beast out of the sea. Now, I'm more and more convinced that the man of sin is the Antichrist. And I'm going to explain my reasonings in a moment. But uh, he's the counterfeit, really, of Christ, because he is going to have a counterfeit death and resurrection. And, and so notice verse Verse one, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, upon the heads the names of blasphemy. Verse three, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered at the beast. And so this false Christ, uh, he is going to have a counterfeit death and resurrection and through him the dragon will achieve his objective of worship because we're going to see that all the world is going to worship the beast verse four they worship the the dragon which gave power to the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? And so just as the Lord Jesus, who really did die and really did rise from the dead, who is also worshipped as God because he is God manifest in the flesh. So this man of sin, this Antichrist, is also going to experience worship. And then the final piece of the satanic trinity is the false prophet. Revelation 13, verse 12 he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And the idea is this, just as the spirit directs all, all our attention to the son, the false prophet is going to direct the world's attention to worship the beast that had the deadly wound and lived. And so he is the counterfeit Holy Spirit. So this satanic opposition to God and his people, referred to in chapter 12, will be carried out by these satanic puppets. He'll be pulling the strings behind the scenes, energizing them, giving them power, and they are willingly uh, enslaved and follow his bidding. Now, I'm just going to close with this, this statement. See, the world wants this man, desperate for this man. Um, the longing of man's heart for this charismatic world ruler has been long evident. Back in 1957, at that time, there was a man called Paul Henry Spark, Spark is spelled S-P-A-A-K. He was the Secretary General of NATO in 1957. And this is what he said. We don't want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we're sinking. Then he said this. Send us a, such a man, and be he a god or, or the devil, we will receive him. Now, now, isn't that a staggering statement? That's 1957. Now, wouldn't you think in 1957 they wouldn't be looking for a man? The reason I say that is 1945, the, the world war came to an end. And part of the reason there was a world war was there were two very charismatic dominant leaders called Hitler and Mussolini, and then one in China, the emperor in Japan, the emperor. And, and they had the allegiance of masses of people, and it caused utter devastation. And wouldn't you think that they would learn the lesson? 12 years later, NATO 
the, the general secretary is crying out, give us a man. <laughs> and whether he's God or the devil, we will receive him. Well, I think the world is even more desperate for that man right now. <laughs> and it's not going to be long before he appears on the scene. But he cannot appear until we disappear. <laughs> he will appear once we disappear. But he, the world is desperate for such a man. And so we'll have to leave it there. Our time is gone. We will look more at Revelation 13 next time. Amen.